Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Hey, as we record this, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We sure are. This is the first time that we have recorded the podcast with everyone involved in their houses. Yeah, we are entirely remote this go around. This is our first of those, as Tracy just said. So uh, Tracy is usually at home, but today I am also at home. And Casey, our amazing super producer, also at home. So um, fingers crossed that our maiden voyage of doing it this way works out fine. We did a test. It worked out fine. But yeah, all of this that's going on, all of these changes to our day-to-day lives, however temporary they may be, and the virus that has caused all of this, got me to thinking about contagion and germ theory and the various points in history where people have been trying to figure out the science of disease. And as I kind of snorfled around on the internet looking for things related to that, it led me to Max von Pettenkofer. And one of the things that I found in my research for this was a lecture by Yale professor Frank Snowden. It's part of their open Yale courses. And he described Pettenkofer as, quote, the most sophisticated and scientifically robust of those we might call wrong. So Pettenkofer's ideas about specifically how cholera, but also other uh, diseases spread, were not exactly right. But even though he was kind of on the wrong track, his work still had some really beneficial impacts on the way that we live. And he also had a lot of twists and turns in his early life. And I'm hoping that those which are pretty entertaining, plus talking about these concepts in a way that's a little bit removed from what we are all currently living through, will offer a way to consider just how far we've come in figuring out epidemiology. We do need to offer a quick heads up. There is a brief mention of suicide in this episode. I'll add an additional heads up just because I was eating my breakfast when I got to this part of the outline. Toward the end of the episode, there's a little gross medical bit that, you know, it'll become clearer when we get closer to it. Yeah, no part of you will doubt was that it. So Max von Pettenkofer was born at home on December 3rd, 1818 in Lichtenheim, Bavaria, near the Danube River. His father wasn't exactly a farmer. He worked the land, but really only to the point of subsistence. It was not a vocation, really, on his part. Yeah, they were very poor. His family was Catholic, and they were obviously of extremely modest means. Max was fifth in the birth order. He had a total of seven siblings, so that is a very busy and crowded house. It made for more people than could realistically fit in their living situation. Max, as a consequence, did not have a bedroom of his own. He actually bedded down each night in the hallway. There's kind of a landing at the top of the stairs that had a little crook to the side of it, and that is where he slept. Those early years of Max's life, unsurprisingly, were not particularly happy. The family's poverty took its toll, as the Pettenkofers just never had enough to make ends meet. When Max was nine, his fortunes changed, though. He was sent to Munich to live with an uncle, Dr. Franz X. Pettenkofer, Franz was a successful apothecary. He was in a way better financial position than Max's parents were, so that constant state of need was no longer part of Max's life after he moved to Munich. There was just a whole new future of possibilities opened up for him, and this is a case where he definitely explored a lot of them. Uh, First off, he started a formal education. So he attended grammar school, and then he went on to high school, and he graduated in 1837 when he was 18. He graduated with honors. And he initially seemed to be leaning towards literary scholarship. Uh, He also wrote poetry, which was good enough to be published in a collection. He shifted his focus after he enrolled in college at the University of Munich. The idea on his uncle's part was that Max could study pharmacy and chemistry and then eventually take over the apothecary. And Max started his higher education with that as the plan. But there was also a problem, which was it turned out that he hated those courses. He also dabbled with the idea of law, maybe even theology. Those eventually turned out not to hold his interest either. Oh, if you've ever taken a a class you hated, it's excruciating. So to have a bunch of them, I feel for him. Uh, So naturally, with none of these other ideas about his future really being anything that was working for him, he decided to become an actor. (laughs) 
perfectly normal path for a scientist. Uh, he remembered acting in school plays and loving it, so that seemed to him like a perfectly good option that he hadn't explored yet. As you may imagine, none of this went over particularly well with his uncle. Uh, their relationship, as a consequence, did, uh, on a serious note, become really, really tense. And eventually there was a physical altercation where Franz hit his nephew. And Max, at that point, disassociated himself from his uncle, which also meant that he was separating himself from his uncle's financial support. This whole theater thing actually seemed like it might play out for a little while. In 1840, he was appearing on stage as Max Tenkoff in various productions. He was handsome and smart, and his time studying literature in his younger years really served him well. But depending on which biographical account you read, it seems like his reviews might have been pretty mixed, and it became apparent that this was not going to be a way for Max to support himself. Yeah, some accounts say that he got pretty um, consistently, not even panned. It wasn't even that. It was like people were like, eh, he's fine. Uh, others say he did he did quite well. So we don't really know. But clearly it was not a career that was going to work out. But he did make an important connection during this time as an actor. He met a young woman named Helene Pettenkofer. They have the same name because she was a cousin and they fell in love. Uh, the two of them married, and it was actually this marriage that ended up reconnecting Max to his uncle Franz, and Helene helped encourage the two men to reconcile. In 1841, Max moved back to Munich with his new wife and, with his uncle's support, started to study medicine. Just a year after that, he was publishing articles on chemistry, specifically on the detection and isolation of arsenic. In March of 1843, he was granted an apothecary degree, and then after completing his medical thesis on South American plants that were believed to have curative properties, he received the degree of Doctor of Medicine, Surgery, and Obstetrics. Yeah, I'm not 100% clear on why this whole science thing worked for him this round, unless he was really just trying to step up and find a vocation in which he could support not only himself, but his new wife. He was very dedicated to Helene. Uh, but this time around, it was like his curiosity kind of worked out and he got pretty into his medical career. Uh, Pettenkofer's medical education had always focused primarily on chemistry. And his first position after completing his education was working in a lab in Würzburg, researching urine and isolating various substances in it. In this work, he showed that hippuric acid and sulfocyanic acid were present in urine. And he also noted a component that was high in nitrogen, although he didn't specifically identify it. Later chemists would identify that as creatine and creatinine, and he also developed a way to test urine for bile salt, and that test has actually continued to be used right up to the modern day. He then moved on to the University of Geisen in 1844 to continue his work as a chemist, but after working under mentor Justus von Liebig for a while there, it was apparent that he wasn't going to be offered a professorship, which is something he had hoped for. There just were not any open positions. Yeah, it wasn't a, an issue of him not doing good work, because though it did not lead to a full-time job, his work with Liebig was quite fruitful. He developed a copper amalgam for dentists to use uh, as a filling for teeth. He also developed a way, along with Liebig, to prepare meat extract as a soup base. That actually led to a company being started. And his interest and his skill in chemistry really suited industrial chemistry projects quite well. So he shifted away from medicine for a while. He was still using his chemistry knowledge on the job that he landed in, but it was very different from what he'd been doing before. He worked in a mint until 1847, and in his time there, it was his job to refine and improve the minting of coins so the most valuable metals used in their production could be stretched as far as possible. One of the other things that he worked on at this time in his life was developing a way to save paintings from mildew that formed as their varnish broke down. You know I fell in love with him for this. Uh, he figured out a way to really carefully apply alcohol vapor to the surfaces of paintings and in doing so reactivate the varnish so that it would kind of reseal the painting and protect its surface from mold and mildew. Pettenkofer had been made an associate in the Academy of Sciences in 1846. And in 1847, he was finally offered a professorship at the University of Munich. He taught medical chemistry there. This was a newly created position. He was paid a small yearly salary, plus two measures of wheat and seven measures of rye. 
He had a research space at his disposal, and his lectures covered topics including public health, sanitation, diet, physical chemistry, and hygiene. Yeah, his interest in all of those really, really continues throughout his life, and as we'll see, uh, it becomes very important. Three years into this new position, Pettenkofer's responsibilities grew because his uncle Franz died in 1850. And as a consequence, Pettenkofer inherited Franz's position as court apothecary. So he was kind of advising the government on on matters of chemistry. And this appointment included the residence that his uncle had lived in, in which Max had lived in as a child. So he got a house out of the deal, and he also got an additional salary for the apothecary position. So things are going quite well. We are about to get into the work that Pettenkofer did while trying to understand the spread of cholera, But first, we will pause for a quick sponsor break. Starting in the 1850s, cholera became the focus of much of Pettenkofer's work. In 1855, his fortunes continued to expand, and his standing in the scientific community grew as well. And he was able to move his lab into the newly built Institute of Physiology, where he had more space to work. And this was also the year that he published a really important work, Investigations and Observations on the Method and Spread of Cholera. During this time, one of the important concepts that he wrote about was the idea of a healthy carrier. While he didn't agree with the contagion theories at the time, and we're going to get into that in a moment, he did think that there could be people who showed no sign of illness whatsoever and yet helped spread certain elements of disease. Max von Pettenkofer started sharing his idea that cholera was linked to a microorganism. But he was also adamant that whatever that microorganism was wasn't enough to make someone sick by itself. He thought a series of conditions had to be met to cause an epidemic. There had to be the microorganism, specific local conditions, seasonal conditions, and individual susceptibility. He really didn't believe in the developing ideas that would eventually lead Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch to develop germ theory. Yeah, germ theory had been kind of developing over time, but they really solidified it. Uh, in the 1800s. Pettenkofer's idea was represented by the simple mathematical equation of X plus Y equals Z. And in this model, the outcome Z was cholera. The variable X was the presence of a microorganism, which again, on its own, he believed to be harmless. And the Y variable represented the local conditions that were contributing factors that would enable that microorganism to actually become infectious. He thought that general uncleanliness offered nutrients for that X microorganism to thrive and that water and warm temperatures and porous soil were also important contributors. The microorganism needed to ferment, basically, kind of the way a plant germinates. And then building on miasma theory, it would release infectious elements into the air. And this idea of Pettenkofer's uh, came to be known kind of colloquially as the groundwater theory. It's also sometimes called localization theory. This theory was in opposition to the work of British physician John Snow, who we have an episode on in the archive. Snow believed that whatever was causing cholera was something that was ingested and was not miasmatic. In 1849, Snow had written an essay entitled On the Mood and Communication of Cholera, outlining this idea. And in 1854, it seemed like he had proven it when he identified a water pump in London's Broad Street that seem to be the source of multiple people's infections. That's the very short version of his story. Uh, Pettenkofer was pretty adamant that Snow was oversimplifying things. He acknowledged that Jon Snow had clearly identified some factor in this whole process in the water, and he actually wrote that no one in his right mind could dismiss that finding. But what exactly was it about the water that caused illness? He felt as though it just could not possibly be a waterborne pathogen. By the way, that word was not even in in the vernacular at that time. It wasn't coined until later. Uh, But he thought that anything that would have been in the water by the time it got to a human would have been far too diluted to actually be dangerous. That big gap in understanding really drove Pettenkofer's work for the rest of his life. He wrote paper after paper over the next four decades, reiterating and refining his ideas This stoked the fires of a long debate in the medical and scientific communities between the contagionists who thought that Snow had identified the problem and the anti-contagionists who thought there were far more factors involved than simply passing some sort of germ 
from person to person. And though cholera was a concentration of his work, Pettenkofer continued to develop theories and experiments in other fields. Uh, This is one of those things where you don't realize how much he worked on until you really dig in, because most of the the biographies or the articles you find about him are just about uh, his anti-contagionism and cholera. But in 1861, he developed the first breath analysis apparatus. It was a chamber in which a subject's exhalation could be analyzed to determine how the body was consuming and using fats and carbohydrates, forming an important foundation of metabolic research. He was then able to use that data that he gathered to develop some of the earliest calculations of caloric needs that a person may require in various living conditions. In 1864, he became rector of the University of Munich, His influence and his work in hygiene led King Ludwig II of Bavaria to believe that hygiene research should be part of all of Bavaria's higher learning institutions. The king ensured that Bavaria's three universities all had chairs of hygiene. Pettenkofer filled that role at the University of Munich. Once these positions were established, hygiene became a required course in all their medical curriculums. And we're going to talk more about some of his work in hygiene as we go along. Uh, In 1865, Pettenkofer, frustrated at the lack of journals that were publishing studies of hygiene, just formed his own. Uh, Zitschrift für Biologie, which is Journal of Biology, was the result. In 1872, he was offered a very lucrative position. The University of Vienna was building a new hygiene institute. They asked him to run it. This was an enticing offer, but Pettenkofer really preferred to stay in Bavaria, so he used this offer to his advantage and told the University of Munich that Vienna really wanted him so that he would consider staying only if he had an institute of hygiene there in Munich. The university agreed to build him one, which took the next seven years, but it did get done, And Pettenkofer stayed, ran this hygienic institute at the University of Munich once it opened in 1879. The institute was highly influential. It served as a prototype for other education and research programs around the world. It was a direct inspiration for the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health in Baltimore. That was founded in 1917. And one of the most important publications during this time when he was really, really prolifically contributing to this idea of hygiene as a science was a lecture titled The Value of Health to a City. And this work broke down in numbers the cost of having a population that wasn't in good health. He noted the average number of sick days taken by a worker in Munich at the time, which was 20, and he calculated that those days cost the city 3.4 million gulden a year. And he then outlined how if they developed a sewage system and they raised sanitation standards, the city could actually far exceed making up for those losses and actually save additional money every year. He studied how air quality impacted population health how clothing impacted health, and the benefits of raising plants indoors. He examined how ventilation could contribute to or detract from overall health. The Pettenkofer number, which is a number that represents, quote, an absolute CO2 concentration of 0.1% or 1,000 parts per million, is still used today. His teaching reflected his findings. He evangelized the importance of clean air, clean water, clean soil, a clean home, as well as good clothing and nutrition. Thus, this idea of hygiene as a medical issue really became an interdisciplinary field. Pettenkofer really considered the role of environment in a person's health, and to him it was very clear that city planning should include this as a consideration. He was not, obviously, the first person to think about this. You can find texts going far, far back into ancient times where there are some connections being made about living conditions and health. But his work to identify specific causal relationships between the way people live and their health beyond what could be considered common sense was pretty new. And he recognized that this was a field that would also have to be agile as civilization shifted over time, writing, quote, it is a peculiarity of hygiene to change its field of research and, within certain limits, its field of study, according to time and circumstances. Even as the Hygienic Institute was under construction, other job offers came in. 
when Pettenkofer was asked to become head of the German Empire Health Council in 1876, he turned it down, although he did serve in a smaller role as a consultant. We are about to head into the later years of Pettenkofer's life, including one very strange and risky experiment. Uh, But first, we are going to pause for a word from the show's sponsors. The 1880s were prolific for Pettenkofer, who continued his examination of cholera and his defense of his theory of how disease spread. In 1882, he collaborated on a project titled Handbook for Hygiene with the German physician Hugo Wilhelm von Siemsen. And that handbook, which makes it sound like a handy thing you could put in your pocket, was actually published in five volumes. In 1883, Pettenkofer founded a second periodical, Archive for Hygiene. This was in many ways an outlet for Pettenkofer to continue his writing about hygiene and disease. In 1886 and 1887, he wrote a total of 756 pages of content for this journal. The same year that he founded it, German microbiologist Robert Koch showed that Vibrio cholerae was the bacterium responsible for cholera. Pettenkofer continued to believe that this was only part of the cause, though, Although Pettenkofer defended his ideas really to the end, Koch's work eclipsed his as it became the accepted scientific fact. One of the big drivers in his writing and research was fieldwork. Pettenkofer was never just postulating about all of his ideas about uh, how disease was passed. He wasn't just sitting in his study. He actually made a point to travel to locations where there had been cholera outbreaks and study the conditions there. Because he was always looking for additional data to add to his ever-growing body of works all in the hopes that he could crack this problem and bring an end to epidemic outbreaks. And that's an important side note that we should make here. The reason the debate between contagionists and anti-contagionists was so impassioned was because these were serious matters of public health. How could scientists and the municipalities who took their counsel protect people? In 1849, a London cholera outbreak that had inspired Snow's work claimed the lives of more than 14,000 people. And this was only one issue that was in play. There were also leprosy, which is now more often called Hansen's disease, typhus, plague, and yellow fever. Disease was something that everyone took seriously and that scientists were constantly trying to understand, even if they came to drastically different conclusions. So, going back to Max von Pettenkofer's field epidemiology, particularly in instances where the location of an outbreak didn't fit the model that he had developed, he was pretty quick to go there and try to figure out why. In most cases, these were instances where a city or a village that had had an outbreak was not built on porous soil, which was something that he felt was vital to how this whole system worked. For example, Malta. There had been a cholera epidemic on the island in 1837, but Malta was rock, which would seem to contradict Pettenkofer's theory about porous soil. But when he actually went and visited the island, he saw that that rock was in fact porous. It's limestone. So he felt like this actually supported his idea. Conversely, he noted that the city of Lyon, France, had not had an outbreak despite being a major metropolitan area that had two rivers that skirted the city center and a bustling trade business. Pettenkofer concluded that even though there were other factors that might contribute to an outbreak in Lyon, the fact that the city's substrate was granite had saved it from epidemics. Yeah, he was like, this whole fermentation process cannot happen here because granite. Uh, And through all of this cholera study, he was also still advocating for a general improvement in hygiene everywhere as a key to good health, and particularly drinking and just having good, clean water, even though he didn't agree with the idea that contaminated water was what spread cholera. He thought everybody should just have clean water because that was best. He wrote, quote, for good health, Pure water is as necessary as pure air, good food, comfortable quarters, and so forth. I myself am an enthusiast in the matter of drinking water, but not from fear of cholera or typhoid fever, but simply from a pure love for the good. For me, water is not only a necessary article of food, but a real pleasure, which I prefer, and believe to be more healthful than good wine or good beer. He was a borderline teetotaler. He was not really a fan of alcohol at all. Boo. (laughs) 
When Pettenkofer turned 70 in 1888, the cities of Munich and Leipzig each gave him cash gifts to be used for his Pettenkofer Foundation of Hygienic Investigation. In 1890, he was elected as president of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences, and in 1893, he was given Munich's highest honor, which was the Gold Burgess Medal, and that was in recognition of his lifetime of work. 1890 also brought some sorrow. Uh, Max's wife, Helene, died that year. And the couple had also lost three of their five children over the years. And all of this loss really took a toll on the scientist in his later life. The most dramatic story of Pettenkofer's life and work took place in 1892. It is the part that I referenced grossing me out when I read this outline during breakfast. He was so convinced that a microorganism alone could not make you sick that he put his own life on the line to prove it. On October 7th, 1892, he got a culture of Vibrio cholerae from a sick patient. He mixed it into bouillon and he drank it. He experienced, quote, light diarrhea with an enormous proliferation of the bacilli in the stool, but he recovered pretty quickly. Two of his students tried the same thing. They both survived, but also became very ill. These were Pettenkofer's thoughts on his rash experiment. Quote, Even if I had deceived myself and the experiment endangered my life, I would have looked death quietly in the eye, for mine would have been no foolish or cowardly suicide. I would have died in the service of science, like a soldier on the field of honor. Health and life are, as I have so often said, very great earthly goods, but not the highest for man. Man, if he will rise above the animals, must sacrifice both life and health for the higher ideals. In 1894, Pettenkofer retired from teaching. Two years later, he also gave up his court apothecary position. And then finally, in 1899, he ended all his other professional obligations and retired primarily to Lake Starnberger in the southwest of Munich. We had a summer home there. In early 1901, Pettenkofer entered a serious depression, triggered by a painful throat infection. On February 10th, 1901, he shot and killed himself. His body was autopsied, and it revealed that he had been living with chronic meningitis, as well as symptoms that would later be recognized as cerebral calcification. Pettenkofer was buried in his beloved Munich in Thalkirchner Cemetery. Today, there's a statue of him in Maximilian Square in Munich. The Hygienic Institute at the University of Munich, which Pettenkofer had leveraged his Vienna offer to get built, was destroyed in World War II when it was bombed on July 13, 1944. More than 20 years later, in 1967, it was finally rebuilt and it became the Max von Pettenkofer Institute. That institute continues today as a research and teaching organization focusing on microbiology, epidemiology, and virology, and it also offers hygienic microbiological testing for clinical facilities. His periodical, Archive for Hygiene, still exists today, although it's now published under the name International Journal of Hygiene and Environmental Health. Max von Pettenkofer may have been wrong about the causes of epidemics, but he was obviously onto an important aspect of public health with his staunch defense of hygiene as vital for the well-being of all humankind. The work that he did, as we said, led to sanitary reform in a number of places, which significantly improved the community's quality of life. And in modern epidemiology, there is a recognition that exposure and outcome can be influenced and modified by other factors, although it's not a cause and effect situation like he thought. Yeah, there's there are definitely all kinds of things that can influence how easy it is for a pathogen to spread and uh, infect people. But like it's not like you you would only contract cholera with these specific things happening uh, like he thought. So to quote with a quote that nicely summarizes Pettenkofer's ideology about the importance of good health. Quote, Everyone who lives upon the earth deserves to be well, for a life without health is a misery, a martyrdom from which everyone longs for release, and when it may not be by other means, even by death. I don't know that everyone would agree with that perspective, but it does see, like sum up his whole philosophy. Yeah, good health is, is the only way to live, and if you can't have it, it's not worth living. It's a little bit grim. <laughs> yeah, I'm like ableist. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's a he's such a an interesting creature, and he his position in all of this really does get 
eclipsed by um, Coke and by uh, Louis Pasteur, who were doing their stuff. And again, because he was fundamentally wrong about contagion, but all of the other stuff he did was amazing. I had no idea about his work in metabolic science mm-hmm. until I had gotten pretty deep into research. And I was like, wait a minute, uh, which is really fascinating because that's stuff that is still used all the time today. Um, and it's an important part of some people's lives. Like if you are an athlete, you're depending on science that he developed to like maintain your optimal performance. Um, because most athletes have a very serious like nutrition plan that's developed after measuring how they're burning carbohydrates and fat. And that is all part of this. I, I love that. Uh, here's a, a trick that is happening as we transition to this new age of recording at home. I usually keep a nice stack of listener mail prepped in the office, and I'm bummed because that's one of the things that we won't be able to do for a little bit um, because we're not there to receive it. And in fact, I think uh, that building is is not going to be receiving it, at least not in the normal way that we have been Um which stinks, but we'll get back to it. I promise once all of this blows over and I can get back to your marvelous parcels and postcards, uh, they will be top of mind. Yeah, if you've been thinking of of sending something to us, we definitely appreciate your thought and generosity. Uh, I would wait. <laughs> yeah, hold off, because I don't know the fate of that stuff right now. Um, I'm sure it's going somewhere and it's probably like being stored somewhere, but I don't know how long it's going to take for anything to eventually get parceled out actually to us once everything is back up and running. Uh, So if you have something you've been longing to send us, just sit on it for a bit. It'll still, it'll still be sendable when (laughs) we're all done. Um, Yeah. So what I will do is take this opportunity to thank our listener, Catherine, who is also someone who I interact with on Twitter a lot and has become something of a friend. And she um, very sweetly sent me uh, a Godzilla magnet and a little r2d2 lapel pin like it's r2d2 in this really stylized way uh to our office it was one of the last things i was able to open before all of this happened so thank you so much Catherine. like that was just the sweetest and i love that it relates to both star wars which i love and uh godzilla which we have talked about on the show before and i also love if you would like to write to us email is a very safe bet you can do that at history podcast at iheartradio.com you can also still find us on social media as missed in history pretty much everywhere and if you would like to uh, subscribe to the podcast if maybe you're a new listener who has stumbled upon us looking for something to entertain you in these times of shut-in uh you can do that on the iHeartRadio app at apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.